Hey folks, Darren with Fervent Astronomy. Today we're going to be looking at this, the Canon RF mount 100mm f2.8 L macro IS USM for Canon's RF mount. I am aware that I'm not holding the lens. So uh, I had this lens in, did some samples with it, filmed a comparison with its older sibling, and forgot to film this video. So here we are, this is what we're gonna have to make do with. Uh, all that being said, this lens is well built. Externally, it's gonna be very similar actually to the Canon 100 millimeter EF macro. And basically, I'm gonna read the spec sheet to you. 67 millimeter front filter thread. We've got one of Canon's uh, little control rings at the front of the lens, which is nice. You have the usual autofocus, manual focus switch, focus limiter, and an IS switch, so you can turn the IS on or off in the lens. You also, on this lens, have a fairly wide focus ring. This lens, while it doesn't come with it, also is able to take a tripod foot, which I'm sure Canon is happy to sell you. It is luckily shipped with a hood, which is nice of them to do, and a soft lens pouch, I think. But uh, that tripod foot is unfortunately not included. But one thing that differs from other lenses for macro that Canon's put out in the past is they now have a spherical aberration control ring. And that allows you to control the quality of the bokeh because I guess Canon's meaning for this lens not just to be used for macro, but also portraits. Macro lenses can be commonly used for portraits, and this gives you some control over the look of the depth of field as it goes out of focus. That, I'm wondering if it's gonna affect any of the performance of the lens for astrophotography. So we are gonna find out and since I don't really have the physical lens here to show you right this exact second, let's just jump right into Lightroom and get down to business. Hey folks, welcome to Lightroom. And we've got here four samples taken with the Canon RF mount 100 millimeter F2.8 L macro IS USM OMG. Just kidding. So this here is taken with the Canon EOS R5, currently the highest resolution sensor Canon has available in their mirrorless line. These are 60 second exposures. They're 60 seconds tracked on the Fornax Mounts Light Track 2. Fervent Astronomy is Fornax Mounts exclusive North American distributor. So if you are interested in a bomb proof portable tracker, you can check us out at ferventastronomy.com. That being said, these samples are also all taken at ISO 400. Now why ISO 400? Well, Every camera is different and a lot of modern cameras with modern sensors have what are called ISO invariant sensors or ranges, which is to say that a camera used to have something like let's say a 5DSR would have a separate analog amplification at every true ISO, uh, every full ISO stop. What happens now a lot of the times is a camera might only have two. The uh, recently released Sony A9 Mark III only has one. Uh, sometimes cameras might have three, uh, but in this case, the Canon R5, how should you say, uh, main ISO range starts at 400. This is using a single analog amplification stage. And what's happening basically is every ISO above 400, all the camera is doing is it's coming up here and it's basically boosting the exposure. It's doing digital amplification. Digital amplification doesn't amplify only the signal, it also amplifies all of the noise. Analog amplification stages amplify mostly the signal, some types of noise, but not all types of noise. So they are superior for that reason, and that's why, generally speaking, you're told to go for a lower ISO uh, to get a cleaner exposure. But in this case, whether or not I'm at ISO 400 or 4000, I'm going to actually get the same results. So it doesn't make sense to me to lock myself in at 4000 when I can just use 400, uh, the tracker can handle it, I can track no problem, so I can do a nice 60 second exposure, get some decent exposure on there, and away you go. Anyway, for those who've seen my reviews before, I don't want to bore you too much, so let's just get into it. 
got four samples here starting at f2.8 and going to f4. I'm just really quickly going to turn off the profile corrections because these get applied whether you want them or not. All right, so we've got four samples here starting at f2.8 and going to f4. Basically, if you're going past f4, why are you using a 2.8 lens is generally my thinking. But here we have our first sample wide open. And here we can see there's a bit of vignetting. It's a little easier to see here if you look in the navigator. Corners are darkened quite a bit, so they are getting less exposure than the center, which is comparatively brighter. Popping into the center, here we see that we've got some fairly round stars. They're not too bad, although I am noticing as we come here, just to the edge of the, fr sort of out of the center of the frame, very briefly, we're already getting a little bit of elongation of shape here, which is odd. You wouldn't expect to see that right here. You, you might expect it closer to the edges. But let's go take a look. All right, this is about what you would expect in a lot of cases. Here you've got some funky shapes. Now what you're seeing here is not coma. It's not chromatic aberration, which is what a lot of people call this. This is actually astigmatism. It's two different types of astigmatism, actually. The main type that you're seeing here, these little lines that are all moving in this direction, that's tangential astigmatism. Tangential astigmatism radiates either, you can think of it towards or away from the edge and the center of the frame. So there will always follow radii like this. So if we come up here, we can see that there's some elongation and it's always towards the center of the frame. And here there's some real wonky stuff going on. Now I did make sure to have the lens's spherical aberration control set properly to a neutral point. So I don't know if this is just a manifestation of that essentially being present in the lens at all, but it does look like we've got a bit of difference uh, in the shapes of the astigmatism. We'll come back here to the top left hand corner and you can see here we've got little lines and then we've also got some that have like this other little line in a different direction basically. That's sagittal astigmatism. Typically it might make these shapes look like little birds or little little flying T's. Here it's odd in that it's not symmetrical on, on both sides of them. It's sort of in a different plane which is interesting but sagittal astigmatism where the tangential radiates from the center, sagittal kind of rings it. So it'll always be at a, a right angle essentially to the tangential astigmatism. And it's quite odd the differences in the star shapes and like here it's hard even to tell what's tangential and what's sagittal astigmatism. It looks like one, one hemisphere of, of the astigmatism is favored over, over the other because I'm pretty sure this here it would be sagittal astigmatism. Just everything on, you know, from viewed here from the left side here is a bit, I guess, de-emphasized and everything on the other side here is emphasized. So that's quite interesting. It's going to be a bit tough to handle. Come here to the bottom right hand corner and again the shapes are a bit different. The blue and green colors I believe are the tangential astigmatism. Well it, it's chromatic aberration but it's it's happening along that tangential line. And then the sagittal is this a little bit red. So that's quite interesting. I've, I haven't actually seen that particular manifestation before. So well that being said Let's look in the mid frame here and yeah, here we've got some changes in star shapes. This is the center. We'll go check over here and yeah we've got some star shapes here and maybe even a little bit of coma, actual coma. So what true chromatic aberration is is when the stars kind of spread out and you get a fuzzy tail like a comet. That's where it gets the name chromatic aberration and it will be either internal where it's pointing towards the middle of the frame or external where that tail will point towards uh, the edge of the frame and it will always you know radiate around the frame or towards the center depending on where you are but it does look like there could be some happening there because it typically is somewhat opaque but not completely you know not completely filled in a little bit fuzzy so that's interesting that's pretty close to the center of the frame which is interesting if we come here in the center, dead center, everything looks mostly okay. I'll, I'll leave it to you to really pixel people. It looks like there might be something happening on the edges of some of these stars, but hmm. Well, the, the end effect of all of this is that it will cause these stars around the edge to sometimes look bigger than the stars in the center. 
And when viewed at a normal viewing distance, like we don't really care if the stars are a little bit blobby or not because we can't tell, we can't resolve it with our eyes. So here is sort of the viewing distance or viewing someone might do on their, their computer, like you're doing now or on your phone, and you might not be able to tell what star is a different shape or not. So take that as it is, it's not you know the end of the world. We're gonna just cycle through here, right in the middle, cycle through 2.8, this is f3.2, f3.5, and f4. And obviously by f4 things are quite dark. Again, you might not use a 2.8 lens for this. You might as well get a, a different lens. Smaller apertures are usually easier to design for. Here we can see the tangential astigmatism hasn't been resolved. The sagittal astigmatism isn't manifesting as prominently. Here, these are probably the strongest examples and and it's tightened up a bit. We'll go back, f4, f3.5, f3.2, f2.8. So by 2.8, things are, are quite a bit, quite a bit bigger here uh, than they were at f4. So yeah, not really sure what to make of this, to be honest. It's not what I was expecting from this particular lens. Let's pop into the develop module and we will remove chromatic aberration. Wasn't really a huge issue with this lens. So you could try and address some of these manually if you wanted with the eyedropper tool. But as you can see, just doing that has created this sort of weirdly brown square around the star and the star and the star and the star. So that is problematic. Not worth doing that. In favor of that. That being said, bring that amount down. You might be able to find a happy medium, but I don't really think it is that big of an issue. We will apply corrections. Ooh, look at that. All right, well, so a couple of things are happening here. So the vignetting is being addressed when we apply the corrections for the most part. There's still some there, but it's getting cleaned up a fair amount. And the center of the, the frame here is getting pulled towards us quite aggressively. So these profile corrections include corrections for distortions. And in this case, I think this lens has what's called pincushion distortion. So if you imagine if this was a grid, you would get essentially um, bent lines. If you're taking, let's say, a picture of a brick wall or something, they'd sort of bend in toward the center of the frame almost as if the center was getting kind of pulled away from you. It's called pin cushion because if you can imagine sticking a pin in a pin cushion, there's that central point that pushes down and it kind of creates like a little, a little well. That's kind of where that comes from. In this case, when we enable the profile corrections, the geometry of the lens is being changed to flatten it. For the most part, we're not losing any focal length, at least, well, maybe just a tad horizontally. The corners seem to be staying put. We're losing some on the long edge. It's kind of getting cropped out. And the, the center is essentially getting stretched to correct for that distortion. So this is more what a true flat field would be if you had a lens that was truly flat. And you know, with a little bit extra tweaking in the vignetting, you might be able to make it even more consistent. Of course, the astigmatism is still present. But overall, it's not that much of an issue. When it really becomes an issue is when it starts to appear a lot bigger than the stars in the center. When I do time lapses, it's something that, uh, that can kind of get in the way because it makes it look like the viewer's seeing everything through a, a lens or like the bottom of a bottle or something where the stars start out really big when they enter the frame, get small, and then as they exit the frame, they blow it up again. But in this case, I don't think it'd be too much of an issue. That being said, there is a lot of aberrations pretty close to the center of the frame. That kind of has me sort of stumped. It's a little bit disappointing to see, but you know what? No lens is perfect, and this lens has been optimized for that a spherical aberration adjustment. We can change the way the bokeh shows up in the frame, so that probably is a trade-off of that particular feature. That being said, I hope this has been interesting Feel free to download the samples and take a look at them yourself and decide if 
this is the type of lens that you could live with if you wanted to. And uh, yeah, all right. What did you think? Is that what you expected? I can tell you that I did not expect there to be coma in the center of the frame. And I'm very, very sure that I had that SA control set at the neutral spot. It's a spherical aberration control. I don't see that causing coma, especially not in the center of the lens there. And, you know, actually it was a little bit off center uh, with the, the center of the coma being uh, a little bit out of the center frame. So I really don't think that the SA control had anything to do with that. I think that just might be a factor of this lens trying to pull double duty as a portrait lens. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Keep that in mind. It is a possibility. Uh, given the overall performance of the lens, I would maybe consider other options if you're in Canon RF mount, such as the older EF mount lens. But uh, you know what? I'm not here to make the decision for you. I'm just here to show you what the lens performs like and let you make your decisions based on that. But uh, that's pretty much it. I'm Darren. This has been Fervent Astronomy. Thanks so much, and we'll see you in the next one.